Hello and assalamu alaikum uh, brother Waqar and thank you for agreeing to come on the show. Uh, it's very interesting. I know I've known you for a very long time and uh, I've always wanted to speak with you and uh, about your experience in psychotherapy and dealing with many cases, many issues dealing with uh, a lot of the problems that are happening in society and uh, a lot of cases that are coming in uh, and a lot of interesting and concerning issues that mm-hmm. are affecting our community and other communities and uh, and the types of problems you deal with on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure, uh, Nabil. Anything uh, for you? Mashallah, I have known you, as you said, uh, for a really long time. And it's uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be with you today. So, Alhamdulillah, I've, I've known you for quite a long time, many years, uh, maybe 10, 15 years or so. But uh, for, many, for people out there who might not know you, if you can please uh, introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I initially... Um, basically, my qualifications are, um, I did my master's in organic chemistry, and then I did my bachelor of education program from uh, York University and started my career at Islamic uh, Foundations um, School uh, as a high school chemistry teacher and science teacher. And uh, then uh, I, I went on to become the school principal and um, I took the school from uh, almost nowhere to number one position in terms of EQAO results. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it was very fulfilling. Uh, but uh, then there, is, there was a change of heart. And I wanted to do something for the broader community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's when I thought of doing master's in counseling psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. So I'm a registered uh, psychotherapist registered with the Ontario College of Psychotherapists. Um, and um, I also um, I, I also did a couple of other additional courses, um, one in anger management, uh, a specialization from uh, New York, USA. And then I also um, did uh, domestic violence uh, program, we call PARS program. Uh, specialization uh, from Minnesota, Duluth, USA. So these are a couple of um, things uh, that I did in the field of psychotherapy. That's very good. Um, So what made you change from studying chemistry and maybe pursuing that into a career and then moving on into teaching and uh, taking that as a profession to start with? Um, Actually, when I started tutoring um, students when I was in grade seven. So I was tutoring grade four students when I was in grade seven. So I wanted to be self-reliant. So right from the beginning, get go, I wanted to do something on my own. And, you know, I never asked for um, monthly allowance from my uh, grandmother who I grew up with. So I was self-reliant right from grade seven. So I started earning and I found that uh, science intrigued me right from the beginning uh, and and teaching more so. So all along right from grade seven up until really um, up until I would say 2015, I was in teaching profession. So In the beginning itself, when I started teaching uh, younger kids, I felt that this is the profession for me. And chemistry, um, the students used to tell me that it flows in your blood, right? I memorized the entire periodic table, and the way I used to teach, the students loved it. Very good, Uh, very good. So alhamdulillah, all all along, and I used to guide students. So I, in a way, I I was their guidance counselor too, in a way. They loved uh, the additional... Uh, things that I brought to the table while teaching. Very good. Uh, I know you were teaching for many years at uh, the private Islamic school in Scarborough. And then, uh, so what happened after, when did you decide to move on from teaching kind of into psychotherapy, counseling psychotherapy? Yeah, so um, what happened is um, there are two reasons, actually. Number one is Islamic Foundation School was um, purely academic and they always wanted students who excelled. They had, they had the entrance test and they wanted the cream of the crop. So they were unable to cater to the needs of 
a specific section of the society if the student is, is academic either academically weak or more so uh, students with exceptionalities like autism adhd etc mm-hmm. so i remember two parents cried in my office that i had to reject them their plea uh, to admit their children mainly because we didn't had any resources to cater to their needs mm-hmm. and that made me start uh, to think uh, that we need i need to, i needed to do something for this section of the society especially mm-hmm. and i really really wanted to do it but then covid happened and during covid uh, you know people lost jobs and uh, they were unable to pay the fee of a private school like islamic foundation so the numbers started dwindling mm-hmm. and that's when i thought to myself uh, it's better i move on and and complete my uh, masters in counseling psychotherapy and that gave me an opportunity and alhamdulillah i was able to fast track that pro- program i doubled up my courses mm-hmm. and alhamdulillah i was able to finish and i'm glad that i finished this course and i'm really enjoying it helping everyone broader society that's awesome awesome so please explain how did you set up uh, hope counseling and anger management as your business or service uh that's quite interesting so i was doing internship at uh, one of the institute uh, one of the center which is called Avon Counseling Center mm-hmm. that's where i f- completed my uh internship and that was the center that that specialized in anger management uh, and they wanted me to be specialist in that particular area so they gave me this idea that why don't you become specialist so I went on to uh, complete my uh, specialization in anger management from New York, uh, USA. Now I have the certification. I'm registered anger management as a specialist in USA too. And I can actually counsel the clients legally in 26 states of USA because of that certificate. Oh, very good. Uh, yeah. and, and I feel the root cause of a lot of problems in society, relationship issues, couples issues, it's anger. Mm-hmm. so i felt that it it is a central uh, issue uh, it, all of the other issues are peripheral to this main anger management issue i see so Very interesting so so that's how i ended up completing this so so what kind of um mental health issues are you seeing with your clients on a regular basis um on a regular basis um number one obviously you know um there there are there are a couple of uh, definitely um I- I- issues but the, the the issues that uh, stood out to me um are you know there are couples uh, not exactly in the order uh, you know chronic uh, chronological order but uh, domestic violence is in the on the rise couples issues there are relationship issues between uh, wife and husband huge huge and anger plays a very very important role in that i feel um then i also uh, fa- found uh, that a lot of um kids very young as young as 4 years old 3 years old they are diagnosed with exceptionalities um such as autism adhd um and uh, uh you know dyslexia mm-hmm. this is on rise i feel and the research shows that uh, first of all we have nuclear families now uh, we don't have extended families living under the same roof so the kids um are growing up with mom and dad and both normally both are working so they don't have much time to uh, spend with their children yeah. uh, and 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 that is uh causing a lot of issues in in kids such as uh, language delay is another huge huge one speech delay um and another is adhd because mainly because both parents are working even after coming home they have other chores they are giving uh, ipads and laptops there is a lot of screen time mm-hmm. and research shows that just 2 hours of screen time per day um increases the probability of having attention deficit significantly 
mm-hmm. just two hours. And now we find that kids are spending, uh, give or take, five to six hours per day on on screen. So and then another one is uh, the food color. It's it's a very very important. We tend to uh, ignore this, but uh, research shows that food color causes a lot of attention issues uh, in in uh, kids, um, such as ice creams, very colorful. Anything, any food item that is ex- really colorful Interesting. is you know it has. Uh, impact on the psyche of the students and their behavior. Is there any specific uh, colors or like um, mm. e-numbers that are known or it's kind of general? In, gen- in ge- general, uh, they are seeing yellow and red are really, you know, big. I see. Uh, these two colors. Um, and normally food we find, uh, you know, in, in uh, Southeast Asian kind of food, you know the, I see. the yellow color is a lot, a lot of yellow color is used in mm-hmm. in food like biryani etc or um uh, red color is used in um, deserts yeah, right yeah, yeah. so so are are you dealing with mostly people from kind of our community or from other communities as well different ethnic groups or faith based communities who kind of if you can d- divulge what sort of communities you see problems with um I, I I'll in all honesty I I have um, a lot of clients from other communities rather than our own uh, community which is uh, Southeast Asian uh, so I I see um, a whites I see African Canadians and a lot of other ethnic, uh, uh, from Arab world mm-hmm. um, but uh, mostly Canadians um, you know and uh, the it, it, there, are, there are a lot of similarities. Mm-hmm. The, the issues are common amongst the various ethnicities. A lot of, I lot of issues I, I see. Is there a delineation uh, between um, for, uh, different socioeconomic uh, communities? If you know people who are further well off versus uh, lower off people on the lower economic scale, is there a difference that you're seeing, or no? You're seeing kind of a more equal, normal distribution across all. Uh, income brackets yeah yeah no definitely definitely i mean i even i find uh, you know people uh, in the higher economic uh, strata they they have their own issues they are also having um issues especially um between wife and husband or boyfriend and girlfriend like uh, between couples yes i i find even in millionaires amongst uh, wife and husband or boyfriend and girlfriend a lot of lot of uh, issues uh, in terms of work distribution or um, uh, attention time, like I mean, and quality time. Mm-hmm. They are unable to spend quality time. Mm, the, the basic problem that I hear is uh, that attention is not paid to each other. Uh, they are on screens. Once they come home, even they are on screen, uh, and and they are not paying attention to each other and. Uh, uh, Substance abuse is another huge, 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 huge problem um, I, that is uh, between um, couples. Mm-hmm. Um, w- under the influence, individual doesn't know what's going on and how to communicate, and uh, that is causing uh, a split. I see. Uh, you know, in so um, in terms of the solutions that you offer, are there any solutions that you're offering outside of medical intervention or are, are, are these then progressed onto some kind of medical prescriptions or there's more kind of non-medical interventions or solutions that you offer? Uh, I, uh, being a licensed uh, psychotherapist, I'm not supposed to prescribe any medication. Mm-hmm. So it's mainly uh, through talks and, and suggestions Uh, that uh, I try to help my clients. Uh, In extreme situations where probably medication is required, a psychiatrist can definitely, uh, is able to prescribe medication. I'm not supposed to. So medical doctor basically Mm -hmm. is supposed, a lot of clients have apprehensions about taking medication because of their side effects. Yes. Um, So normally, they feel very good after having a therapy session. They feel like making changes normally. Yeah. But in extreme situations uh, where it's not possible to correct certain things through talk therapy, mm-hmm. uh, I uh, refer them to a psychiatrist. Uh, but so, that's very rare. Yeah. Um, 
so what kind of solutions are you offering people? So when you're talking through, is it just the dialogue of, uh, uh, of you know, speaking with somebody and, and just asking questions and being an, a lending an ear? Or are you offering some kind of solutions that they can take back with them and, yeah. and implement in their daily life? Yes, yes. For example, I'll just give you uh, an example from anger management because I specialize in that. Uh, and domestic violence, both actually. I have a specialization mm-hmm. in both. Um, so for a, for an example, um, if I get a case, like normally lawyers refer their clients to me, um, court mandated cases. So for example, um, if an individual has anger management issue, one of the simple strategy that I suggest to them is pause, think and choose three steps. So normally when people are, are angry, as soon as they hear something, they want to react. Mm-hmm. And that that makes the situation volatile. So I ask them to pause and listen to the, to, to the other person, what this person is trying to tell you, right? Then think what kind of words to choose to respond. So normally the, the clients find it uh, really helpful because they are not now reacting to everything that their partner is, or someone else is telling them. Mm-hmm. They are able to process that information and choose the right words to respond. And it makes a huge difference. And I also tell them that the life of anger is just 90 seconds, mm-hmm. one and a half minute. So if an individual decides not to do anything within that time period of 90 seconds, it makes a huge difference. It it gives them the processing power. Another one is as per the Canadian law, if someone is angry, then this person should not be in the same physical space with another person that they are having issue with. They need to leave the space, physical space. Mm-hmm. Go out, go to do to another room. But if they feel that the partner is chasing them into another room too, then it's better they they say, I'll, "Honey, I'll be back in half an hour or one hour, whatever time they think it will take." Uh, for them to cool down, they should move out of that physical space and take time to cool down. And I give them homework mm-hmm. and and ask them next week or in the, in the next session you know, did you follow these instructions? Is there any improvement? So there are strategies, proven strategies uh, that they take home and then they apply those strategies in their life and uh, they feel uh, the difference. And and a lot of, I have a lot of happy clients. They come back and uh, tell me that, uh, you know, uh, Vikar, it made a huge difference in my life. Uh, since I had that's uh, great that's <laughs> awesome so uh, uh, you talked about marriage a little bit you talked about some issues that people face in marriage uh, in terms of not giving quality time yeah. or anger yeah. um, kind of what are some other cha- challenges a lot of people are facing in their marriages or for couples that are in, in long-term relationships yeah is it uh, violence in relationships is it something else that's uh, kind of affecting a majority of relationships yeah yeah no there, there are there are a variety of uh, you know marriage or relationship is is very tricky and uh, every every relationship i i personally feel is extremely unique Mm -hmm. um it'll be uh you'll be surprised to know that a lot of couples come to me uh fighting on the issue of uh food and you'll be surprised like it's such a trivial thing but the you know the individual says i come home after hard work i'm a construction worker mm-hmm. i'm really 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 hungry at 7 p.m. i knock the door and my partner comes out and starts you know instead of welcoming me uh, talks about the issues that's bothering him or her and uh, the partner is not willing to listen to me that i'm hungry <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So they simply they need food. And after that, you know, the other partner can definitely talk about whatever is bothering them and whatnot. It's just very, very simple requests they have. I think I, food is a very good mood regulator. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Once uh, somebody's had a good meal, they're definitely settled down for most cases. One of the golden rule, Nabil, is 
um, the, the problem, the problem, main problem, I'll tell you, the root cause of all the problems, unmet need mm-hmm. is the problem. If that need is not met, so need could be need for food. So mm-hmm. if somebody is hungry, they come home, they want food. Okay, just a sandwich or something. All of a sudden, there is sudden change in the mood. Like the person feels relaxed and put re- probably would respond to any question in a much calmer way. Yeah. Need uh, for rest. Probably this person had night shift, doesn't want even food, want to take rest, right? So the, the, if, if that opportunity is not given to this individual and another chore is given or whatnot, then the, the, this person is got, not going to be happy. Obviously, there will be a really uh, volatile situation at home. Yeah. Um, need for respect is a huge, huge one in every relationship. You know, you know what yeah. they say is, uh, say it, don't spray it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sugar coating. Right, of course. Like, whatever they someone wants to say something, they need to sugarcoat that. Honey, you know, if you don't mind, can I tell you this that you smell bad today, or or whatever it is, it could be. Okay. You know, constructive criticism. Constru- yes, exactly. The same thing. If I if if someone says to me that hey, you know, what a nasty smell smelling guy you are. So then this person is attacking my entire personality. It's nasty guy you are. Rather. You know, normally you you smell good, but today I don't know why, honey. You're you're smelling a little bit bad. Like, can you do something about it? Huge difference, of course. Yeah, right. Of course. So so I I talk to them about this. How you convey your uh, message, mm-hmm. whatever you want to communicate, sugarcoat a bit. That's right. You know, you know, this is this is what we want now, and a lot of issues, a lot of issues. I had one uh, client. Um, suspicion is another one. Oh, this person, my my partner is having a, probably a affair outside. They come and smell them or, or check their pocket, okay. check their phone. Mm-hmm. If there is trust law, if there is no trust, then yeah. there is a huge, huge problem. And the guy is like, oh, you, you don't want to trust me? Then why you want to live with me? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> right? So even if you have any suspicion, you can probably there is a way to convey that uh, Honey, I'm having this suspicion. Uh, is everything okay? Yeah. I know. You, are you still loyal? Straight up, you know. I see. But, but in a nicer way, and especially feed the guy or the girl or whoever is the partner. Uh, feed them first. Make them comfortable. Timing and place is very important to address any issue. Of course. All right. Like no, you cannot add, take up any issue at any time. There is a time and place for everything. Mm-hmm. The person should be relaxed. Both parties should be relaxed. Atmosphere should be nice. Uh, you know, the ambience is, is very, very important. Uh, Before going into be, any, 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 discussions. any discussion. I see. And another huge, huge problem is if there is an issue and, uh, the, you know, it's, if some something is bothering me, for example, then if my partner speaks very nice to me, I should not feel that that issue. It's there's, there's no need to bring up that that issue because I don't want to rock the boat or or ruin the relationship. Mm-hmm. As long as that issue is bothering me, there's a problem. So I need to make sure, even though still the relationship is good, relationship is good, that my partner is behaving nice, everything is going well. I must make sure that at some point I need to bring up this issue in a very nice manner but but this this unattended issue needs to be addressed otherwise it becomes a monster so what you're saying is they cannot be an elephant in the room no and, and an issue that's bothering you on the inside should be addressed as soon as possible given the right time in the right place right place and a lot of couples uh, fail to do this they they feel that if you know everything is going well I, even though i i know this, this there is a, this particular issue about my partner that's really really bothering me mm-hmm. but i don't think it, that i should bring it up because i feel that this partner might either leave me or there could be, there is a possibility of some violence and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then they bottle it up and they are operating at level seven on the anger scale already because of that issue is still bothering them. I see, yeah. Just they need three points to blow up. And that could be as simple as, you know, something that the partner didn't ask for food or something like minor, minor thing. 
and then they erupt like volcano and the other partner is like whoa 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 this person went from zero to 10 in one second but that's not the case the person was already operating at level seven on the scale uh anger scale mm -hmm. um bottling it up that's not good and bottling it up is not good for the individual research shows that whoever that's called implosion if something is bothering and some somebody is bottling it up that's called implosion opposite of explosion interesting so so that implosion that stress can cause cancer uh, can cause heart 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 attack brain aneurysm interesting okay yeah so all sorts of problems so we think that the people who smile and take things easy they are easy going they are, everything is well no no it's damaging themselves inside like they are they are doing more harm to themselves so the best thing is to address the issue whatever is bothering but you know as i said there is a time and place for everything so i, I think uh, um Part of it will, an, another issue I think that's kind of may not be a more comfortable topic would be sexual related issues. Yeah. How much of that are you seeing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of... Uh, um, you talked about unmet needs. You talked about, uh, you know, trust issues. You talked about a lot of other things. Yeah. How, how much does that factor play into relationship issues? Right. Relation yeah, yeah. Now I, I, I get a lot of um, uh, clients... Um, who tell me that, you know, I, I don't even touch my partner. Like, I didn't even touch my partner for one and a half year. A couple of clients told me one year, oh, okay. eight months. I mean, did, there's no intimacy, uh, I mean, mainly because they, they probably they're too busy with their lives, jobs, and after coming uh, home, still they are doing for work for the, 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 the employer, or probably they are on their social media um, and, and updating their accounts and whatnot. And... On top of that, it, they take it as a revenge. They don't want to be nice to the other part. Like if something happens, they they bottle it up, mm -hmm. and they as a, as a revenge, they they don't want to see their partner at all. They don't want to be mm -hmm. in the same bed with them. Interesting. <laughs> Are you seeing that with kind of couples of all ages, or more towards a certain age group? Um, all ages. Interesting. All ages. Um, and and. With the free society, uh, there there are a lot of options outside too. Of so they, it's 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 interesting and funny to to see that they don't want to say I love you to someone that they marry to or they're living with. Um, they, they have a formal relationship, so to speak. They don't want to say I love you to them, except them. They want to say I love you to everyone outside that relationship. I see. So that's really so. Tragic. So I mean, what is gender roles in this uh, situation? You've kind of said him or her, uh, and but what are kind of the gender roles that you're talking about? Where is it usually the the males or the man in the relationship that's coming home from hard days of work and expecting the wife to kind of have food ready and and play the traditional role right. of a of a wife at home, and then also talking about the bedroom you're talking about you know those kinds of issues there yeah. the men are coming from outside are they being ignored by the by their wives in terms of uh, um, sexual needs right um and also loyalty uh, you know where is that wavering in terms of is it the men or is it the women i it, it, it it's both uh, both sexes mm -hmm. I, I would say um are, are not being loyal to their partners um i i i it would be, I think, wrong to say one sex is, you know, uh, loyal to another. Um, but what I what I feel is, um, um, it, it, it's it's common in 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 both. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm hearing these days now is the male partners are t complaining, but I don't want to make any generalization based on this. But what I uh, hear from whites and uh, Hispanic blacks and a uh, couple of other um, ethnicities, Ar Ar Arabs. Uh, substance abuse is on the rise. So they come home, their uh, partner is high, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, and when they ask, okay, what about the chores? Like, did you do this? Did you do that? I was doing work and you are home. I'm talking about specifically those couples where men go out to work and women folk are at home. I see. Uh, looking okay. after the kids and whatnot. 
So uh, they are complaining that th- there is chaos because the, 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 the partner is high on drugs or alcohol. And they, once they come home. Once they come home, that nothing is ready. The food is not ready. They don't even so, know. No, the so, kids. The, so the guy, so the person yeah. who comes home, the yeah. husband that comes home, is yeah. he high or the lady? The, the lady is high. The, at is home. At home. Okay. Yeah. Again, I don't want to make any generalization. There is, a, there is a, another side um, to it too. I'll, I'll I'll speak to you about that in a minute. So, a lot of clients uh, that I got from courts, this is what apparently happened according to their uh, version. I didn't ask the female, so obviously I have slightly biased view, I guess, of this. Mm-hmm. I, I had one-sided um, uh, view of this. Uh, so what the guys are saying is, you know, the whole house is in disarray. And uh, at one point of time, the kid uh, had to be picked up from soccer game and the kid got lost. And because the, the, the female partner was high at home and she didn't know what to do. And he had to rush from a hospital. He's a nurse mm-hmm. to get his kid. So this is one side. The, the other side is at the same time, a lot of girlfriends or wives are referring their boyfriends to me because of the substance abuse. So there's another side to it. Too. I see. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they're saying that uh, this, you know, I want to live. I love this guy. You know, they're like handsome guys. I saw some of them like Hollywood hunks. Um, amazing. But deep into to substance abuse. And once they are high, they are abusive towards their female partners. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they don't know what they are doing in terms of verbal abuse, sometimes even physical abuse, and it's a big no-no. You can't, right? And so the, and and not only that, they don't want to take therapy. So the female partners have to try hard, like uh, you know, make some deals with them. At last, uh, one of I think two of my clients told me that their girlfriends and wives, uh, you know, have given. Uh, them uh, final warning that if you don't take the therapy, we can't live with you. So then they 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 come to me, um, and it's very hard. People who are addicted to substance, yeah, it's very very hard for them to go off of it. Um, sometimes they need. I, I think it's uh, Norflox or something. There there is a medication um, to keep the people off. Uh, drugs or alcohol that's um, that's quite an intervention yeah so um in in terms of our community so we, we are uh, you know the muslim community uh, how are you seeing the issues in this regard in terms of oh. intersexual dynamics uh, uh, between husband and wife in our community and how if you can go into some of those details maybe yeah 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 Lo- our issues are slightly different we i well the, there is substance abuse too here I had recently one client, a Muslim client couple. So the wife complained about uh, husband that he's into alcohol abuse, mm-hmm. um, a lot of alcohol abuse. So she wanted intervention and uh, he doesn't even look at her and, you know, doesn't care about her. And it was love marriage, actually. Interesting. So I I had this couple and I asked the, the gentleman why you behave this way. He said... He says she insults me left, right, and center. So how would I, how do you expect me to talk to her nicely? Like you know, so the, definitely. And then uh, she's kind of a perfectionist apparently. Mm-hmm. So she she's a neat freak according to this gentleman. So she always accuses him of making things dirty, etc. Uh, you know, doesn't keep cleanliness at mm-hmm. home. Are, are so you that's seeing? One, a... um, that's one, mm-hmm. but then in in general, in general, in our community, the major issue is in laws. I see. Um, okay. Yeah. So, wife complains that I'm good to my husband. My husband wants to be good to me, but then in laws are causing the problem. So when, whenever there is extended family, they they are saying that in laws are causing a lot of problems. Even here. That's interesting. Actually, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a bit of cultural baggage for some immigrant communities. Yeah. Uh, you know, even if they've lived here for a very long time, yeah. uh, they carry some of that from from back home. And there's a mentality. Yeah. Uh, I know, especially about South Asian, but also probably other communities. 
and that's and that's definitely a factor. Yeah. Um, and obviously the affordability crisis. People, young married couples, are not able to move out into their own places. You know, yeah. for a number of years potentially, and so they're living with parents. Yeah. And I think that's where issues can arise. Y- yes. Yes. And and then if you if you if you really see it's it's, uh, I mean, it, there are pros and cons of living in a extended family. Like for the one of the pro pro would be uh, that the kids can have grandparents and you know the, that I talked about the communication skills so there are more people to talk to them and that will help them uh, learn the the language communication skills etc yeah um, and you know I definitely especially the grandkids are very important to to the, the grandparents uh, and, and vice versa both it's, it's like a symbiotic relationship i feel interesting yeah. but on the other hand the, the setback is that the young couple are unable to spend more quality time and communicate easily with each other probably because of the you know too much interference from from their own parents that makes sense. Uh, so, do you deal with younger clients, such as teenagers or, or younger kids? Uh, and if you do, kind of, what are some of the issues that you're seeing uh, in that age category? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm currently seeing um, two very young. One is 12 years old. Um, another is probably 16 year old. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the issue is the parents um, come from back home and they were raised in a very aristocratic way, a very strict uh, parenting they had. And they turned out to be good, uh, mainly because it was back then proven that formula that if you are strict to your children, they'll turn nice. And then they migrated to this country where a lot of laws support uh, kids, there are a lot of uh, laws around kid safety and how to treat them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. And and the atmosphere is different here. There's a lot of peer pressure, and 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 the, they they face a lot of different kind of pressures these days. Uh, uh, media pressure, like they want to look certain way. Social uh, media, social yeah. media, um, and and that is causing a lot of pressure for them to look good and behave and act certain way which their parents don't understand, mm-hmm. right? And they go hard on them. And that is leading to depression, rebellion. Uh, they don't want to be, they don't want to adhere to their own culture. Uh, they say that it's too suffocating. There are too many restrictions. Mm-hmm. I, I'm i born in this free country and I have, I know my uh, roles and responsibilities and I have rights in this country. Mm-hmm which parents don't seem to understand. They still go hard on them, physical abuse, mental abuse. And and that is straining the relationship. And sometimes the kids are calling cops on their own parents. Uh, and another one is, another one, a uh, huge, huge one across the spectrum, like amongst all the ethnicities is uh, pressure to excel. Uh, academically or in workforce, uh, get a doc- doctor, medical degree or engineering degree. Uh, and, and the kids who grow up here, they want to make their own career choices, the courses they want. To, they find this very intrusive and interfering. Yes. And that is causing a lot of clashes, I the way that, they dress up even. yeah. I think there's a lot of cultural baggage, uh, a lot of Asian... Canadian parents uh, across the board in terms of East Asian, Chinese, Indian, and other Asian cultures as well to have a a kind of a standard. They want their kids to go into university, not colleges or in the trades, you know, the skilled trades. They want them to pursue the highest degrees, so uh, medic, medicine or, or engineering or law or something like that. So I think there is a very high demand in terms of academic performance. Yes, yes. And I not only, you know, Southeast Asian or in, in general Asian uh, parent, uh, I'm, I'm talking to one of my client currently, who is purely Canadian, who was born and brought up actually in Stowell, uh, a white, her. white guy, uh, white individual. And he is unable to grapple with this idea that how come my kid says no to me, like a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old 
uh, boy. He has two boys uh, and they are uh, outright, like they, they don't listen to him in the sense, whatever he says, you know, he, they don't listen to him. Mm -hmm. So he's baffled by this thought that I never said no to my parents when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Uh, how come my kids don't listen to me? Makes sense. So I'm, I'm uh, right now, currently I'm giving uh, a therapy to the, him and a couple of strategies I gave him that put the onus on them, let them make their own schedule that if they fail to follow anything from that, you can always go back and tell them that, hey, you made it, I didn't make it. Like So involve them. Uh, make it a more democratic process where they <laughs> make their own schedule and stick to it rather than you make something and throw on their face and so put the onus on them onus, onus on them and it, it, it should be more like a consultation process rather than I am the boss and it has to be my way makes sense yeah. makes sense um, so speaking of autism yeah. um what are you seeing and is it on the rise? Uh, is it affecting a lot more kids today and is it increasing? Um, what kind of what are you observing out there? Yeah, yeah, no, um, there is a research, if you Google it, uh, you will find it in, in Peel region, uh, especially they did uh, research and one out of four kids is autistic uh, or with some special uh, exceptionality like ADHD. So it is definitely on the rise, 100%. Or probably it was there from the beginning. Um, uh, there was not much awareness. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but for sure now, a lot of parents are coming forward um, and and uh, saying that, okay, my child is diagnosed. Do you think it's the... being overprescribed? If you're saying it's at 1 in 4, 25%, mm -hmm. uh, is it being overprescribed where every personality quirk or difference is now being seen as something on the spectrum is the definition becoming too broad where almost everybody's getting included into that spectrum or how how is it that it's increasing so much probably um as, as i told you uh, we are having more and more nuclear families smaller families where kids don't have much time to spend with grandparents or extended family members uncles aunts mm -hmm only parents and parents are quite busy um, both parents work after coming home they carry home they have their own chores etc etc so they don't have someone to communicate to um, so that's probably helping um, you know uh, and, and then they give them um, uh, laptops ipads uh, phones etc so there's a lot of screen time mm -hmm. so that uh, definitely plays a very important role in uh, attention deficit disorder uh, Another factor is, as I told, a lot of processed food. You know, people don't have time to prepare home cooked meals. Mm -hmm. you know, everything is processed. In McDonald's, this and that, burgers, pizzas, a lot of processed food. And that is playing a very, very important role. So, um, so you're, what you're saying is the diet is playing a huge role huge in mental health. Mental health and the screen time. These are the yes. two... Uh, very, very important factors that are playing a mm -hmm. uh, role in uh, um, exceptionalities. Um, and the second factor is there is a lot more awareness. Like, uh, you know, Bell has that mental health day. Uh, there's, there's a lot of awareness. Uh, people in the past ignored a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So there was not proper uh, diagnosis. Um, not much funding was given in the past because there was no focus on mental health. Everyone was running after physical health. Yes. So mental health was almost uh, equal. There was a lot of stigma too in the past. You know, people were scared to um, voice out their problems uh, because they, they were scared that they might be considered, you know, a mental case. Or, or, yes. Or, yeah. or okay, yeah. you know, what he's, this guy is crazy and put on heavy medication probably. So, and psychotherapy, etc. These were not well known to people. So a lot of awareness, uh, it, 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 it's, it's really uh, great that uh, more and more people are coming forward with the issues, mental health issues that they're having um, and, and talking about those issues and seeking help. So, so I, um, yeah. what kind of parenting tips are you giving 
uh, parents in terms of raising children in today's climate? One <laughs> very, well, rather two words, I would say, to sum up, uh, and then we can elaborate on that. Uh, love and friendship, two things. That's it, huh? Yeah. Parents, the, the child should be able to say proudly to the world that my mom and my dad are my best friends. Mm -hmm. They should be able to share everything about their friends, um, whatever whatever uh, difficulty they're having. They should not be, they should not feel that, oh, if I say this to my mom or dad, uh, I can face some uh, negative consequence, uh, you know, or, or they'll, they'll, they'll make me feel ashamed mm -hmm. of what I did. Yeah. So oh, we all commit mistakes. Let, let's face it. We are humans, you know, uh, to err is human. So we all commit mistakes. But um, so s similarly, our kids also commit mistakes. They, they go to schools, probably they do something outside with their friends. They should not hide it uh, just because they, they think that, oh, my parents would be upset with me or angry with me. They should not have that fear. They should not do something bad because the, of love, the, because of the fear of losing the, the love of their parents, not because of the fear of parents. There's I a see. huge difference. Yeah. Right. So, so I would say that I would say that it's more and more nuclear families only. Uh, so it is not that if a child knows that you know my parents are so nice to me, but if I do something like this, um, it's they're still going to be good with me. So might as well go do it. That's not a factor. Yeah, there, 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 there is, there is. But definitely, when you know when they come and confess, this is what I did you have to still tell them why it is wrong. And, and you know, you broke my, my heart, my trust. I, I couldn't believe this, you did this. Not like being physical abusive or really uh, such a nasty person you are and this and that. Uh, you know, no, no. Still, you can hug them and say, I don't want to you to commit this thing again. And why they should not do this again reasons behind it they did it okay i agree uh, i cannot go back and, and it's better to see, tell them clearly that it, you shouldn't have done this in the first place but no matter what you cannot you and i cannot go back and change that that's done but let's see how you can prevent this in future like this should not happen in future mm -hmm. still you can pass that message to them that this is not acceptable and I'm not going to accept it again, right? If we reprimand them on their first mistake, chances are that they might go and confess to their friends or someone outside uh, the family. And we don't know how things would turn out. They might hope, probably encourage them actually to do more or not, there is nothing wrong with it. You have every right to do this. Mm -hmm. or we are here to protect you. So that way they move slowly away from the family. And I've seen such cases where the kids slowly moved away from the family because they say, my parents are unable to understand me. They, they don't understand. My friends understand me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. So. I think that's causing a lot of social issues. So, for example, the identity crisis. A lot of mm -hmm. uh, young people today um, uh, is, are, especially with, uh, you know, teenagers, preteens, uh, they're dealing with an issue with their identity, gender identity, personal identity, faith identity. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing with that? Is there a lot of confusing agendas that are playing into uh, young people's minds that are causing them to get to be confused about who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. I, I fully agree with you. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of times, um, it, it's just that if they are, even if they're confused, they're being uh, told that you are right, you're not confused. You have every right to feel this way. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trapped in someone else's body or, or you're, you're, you know, your gender is wrong. Probably if you're, if you're thinking that you're right and, and it's being promoted, 
it's been huge 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 without keeping the the, the parents are kept out of the loop so first of all they are taken away and they, they, you know a, a school social worker might take them in and after that parents doesn't know what's happening and mm-hmm. uh, kids are kids at the end of the day they they are confused probably in their mind you know what they are and who they are so they need a right guidance they, they, and and that's i i feel is being hampered right so um definitely identity crisis is 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 a huge and and as as an individual not just sex sexual identity but who they are and what they want to do in life even they're really really confused i got just now before coming here i got a call from uh, one of my client uh, and the, and and this uh, client is 12 year old and she's feeling empty inside i don't know like there is nothing in me like i feel like dying there is nothing there is emptiness in me she say is that from a a dynamic a domestic environment at home where there's a parent that's missing or there's abuse at home or there's a lot of daily problems is that is is there something another factor at play that's making that child feel that way because it's not really natural for a child of 12, 12 years of age to be feeling empty inside and a lot of anxiety or is that normal i mean it, it's not normal by all means i it's unheard of uh recently uh, i'm getting more and more cases like this um co- there are a couple of reasons covid played a huge huge role according to the parents of this client covid played a huge huge role and um, and, and because the kids were home school they were all alone and there was a lot of death happening they were watching the news numbers in millions so they it created the, f- the phobia f- phobia of death and the wor- world is a very unstable place all mm-hmm. of a sudden um and and so but, even 2 years on it's been it's been a while yeah yeah now. yeah oh yeah it's ptsd now mm-hmm. right um and um uh, access to information what of like everything is on the phone so if someone dies in the community for example uh, so this particular client is traumatized by someone recently died in the community and and she's thinking that she's also going to die one day soon mm-hmm. like this person so okay. she she's really really traumatized by that so information is on the fingertips i had one 10 year old kid and he watched the death of michael jackson videos oh interesting o- uh, online okay. everything is online so we don't know like we give the phone and we we think that okay they might be watching cartoon or what not but we don't know what they are watching actually mm-hmm. in in true sense so he watched a couple of videos so in detail how he died what how many pills he took and he died in sleep this client of mine 10 year old boy was afraid to sleep because he was thinking that he would die just like Jack, Michael Jackson and literally developed the trauma all signs of trauma that the, the short breathness and oh, wow everything like he had all the symptoms so slowly by talking giving uh, real examples uh, of people that Michael Jackson is one out of 9 billion people so if he died in sleep doesn't mean 9 billion people would. so slowly slowly step by step i had to so alhamdulillah now this boy is has fully recovered he is happy uh, Very good. yeah yeah he he's sleeping well everything is going well with him <laughs> that's good <laughs> that's good all is well and well so <laughs> yeah. that's awesome well, that's good to hear that you've been able to solve especially for a young young child do you, do you directly deal with the child themselves or you're going through parents how does that work yep through parents a parent has to accompany them if they are physically visiting my location okay um the the minors have to accompany Uh, with their parents and parents have to sit in, in during the therapy um because it's a huge liability issue and i'm not comfortable with that of course yeah um and but the other safer alternative is zoom of course the yeah. the, the parents feel uh, safe the, you know they're attention free the kids are also attention free and safe in their own safe space that's right so i tend to offer uh, zoom sessions for uh normally uh, kids who are uh, under the age of uh, i would say 18 yeah um are you seeing youth um struggling uh with 
drug and alcohol huge, problems huge 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 i i have starts from peel peel schools and that's where the, 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 there is high concentration of muslim population and what i hear from a lot of parents is that their their kids are into drugs huge it's a very common now mm-hmm. it's very very common um they start with alcohol uh and then pot is very common they think that it is healthy for some reason <laughs> or oh, it's natural it's organic uh there is nothing to worry about there is no harm in in taking pot or weed um and then they go to fentanyl which is very scary very serious Fe- fentanyl uh, causes death we all know a lot of uh, that's happened yes, in yeah, the past and continue overdose. to happen yes there's a lot of overdose overdose yes. i think uh, is that causing violence in increasing in violence huge, in young men especially or huge, youth huge 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 once they are high they really really don't know i got one parent and uh recently uh, one um, client came in uh to see me and she told me that for the first time in life she was scared of her own son because he was high and he she was talking to him that you know he should not be taking these drugs and what not and he came on her to kill her like so for the first time in life she said i was scared to be alone with my own son in the same room 17 year old boy wow so she had to call cops on him that she didn't feel feel, feel safe interesting um so more and more um kids these days it, they say it's a cool factor and it's now legalized um yes. but but i i find a lot of muslim kids are into drugs and alcohol huge percentage interesting and that's scary is it the uh, decriminal decriminalization of hard drugs in canada from our government that's kind of fueling that rise i i feel that i f- definitely there the 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 definitely that something to do with this 100% and peer pressure when the peers you know in public schools they're they're having they're selling and so there's a lot of pre- peer pressure oh everyone is doing i'm mm-hmm. a the abnormal guy right um and other other factors are also uh, other, uh, there are other factors that promote uh, substance abuse mm-hmm. uh, such as uh, you know exam pressure oh how to deal with pressure so the, you know the solution to all the problems these days is drugs any pressure oh mom and dad are upset with me i'm feeling really bad okay i'll take drugs oh there is exam coming up i'm really anxious now i don't know what to do uh, i need to calm down and uh, you know this is drugs acts as um, you know they they desensitize the person right like depressants basically they are nothing but uh, depressants they, they subdue you of course yeah right so so they don't want to face the problems you know they want to run away from the problems and that's when they they, they think that this is the easy solution to all the problems i can i get to forget at least for a few hours my problems and i be happy so um what are families and communities supposed to do in order to safeguard their kids where everything is legal on the streets uh, and kind of everything is available from all the way all the way from pot or marijuana um fentanyl and even harsher drugs and everything's kind of decriminalized so what do we do about it yeah well, personally i i feel that uh, the the kids there are two two places where they spend um most of their time one is a school and another is home right so it if possible if they have means then they should enroll them in schools like islamic schools where um you know at least they don't have free access probably still they might have there too allah alam we 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 don't know and i don't want to speculate but uh, at least it's harder for them to get drugs uh, or alcohol in islamic schools mm-hmm. um number two, at home they should be given uh, you know parents are role models so if they you know behave nicely and behave in certain way islamic way it has a great impact and watch out for their company who they are hanging out with right Com- it's very very important uh, friends play is a very important role and the best place for them to be in masjids where they develop their friendships a lifelong 
uh, you know, buddies. And they, they can go to all halal parties and, and have fun with Muslim friends and pa- parents will have you know, peace of mind, right? So masajid are the, are the place that they should be hanging with. And that is the reason why uh, I want this Stovall Masjid, our Masjid Daruk Khair Center, to be the hub cen- center, you know, where the kids come and not only they, they pray, but they should have this uh, pizza nights, basketball nights, or, or uh, you know, we should have basketball courts, uh, gym, nice gym. Uh, so once they come to masjid, everything is there for them to chill. That's right. right? So yeah. pray, eat, and, uh, and, and play. <laughs> eat, sleep, and pray. <laughs> very good, very good. So where can people find you? Um, on your website or on social media, where, where can anyone find you? Yeah, so on my website, which is hopecounselingcenter.ca, which is H O P E C O U N S E L I N G C E N T R E dot C A, hopecounselingcenter.ca. Mm-hmm. And my phone number is 416 854 7390. So I'm available 24-7. They can call me anytime, even 1 a.m., 2 a.m. if it is emergency. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some suicidal cases where there is no choice for them, right? Yep. They need to find someone so they can talk to me and I'm, I'll am i be more than willing to help uh, anyone who needs help. Awesome. Sounds great. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you so much for uh, giving your time and, and speaking with me and uh, kind of going into some of the details that affect our community in, in Canada. Um, so... Great speaking with you again. Uh, so, inshallah, we'll see you soon. Uh, hopefully, we can speak again. Yeah, sure. Uh, Nabil, inshallah, any, anything for you, brother, and for the Muslim community. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much. And that's been it, guys. Uh, hope you like uh, the video. And please share, subscribe, and comment below. And I'll be leaving a link below for uh, Vikar Ahmed. Uh, if you can uh, visit his website, Hope Counseling and Anger Management, and you'll see more information there. Thank you so much.